Hi, and welcome to another edition of Todd Talk, where we take teaching theory and turn it into teaching practice. The theme for this month is going to be the grouping of gifted students and how there are various ways to do that. Uh, so that's in the 22 years that I have been teaching gifted or, or coordinating gifted, the one thing I have discovered is that there is no one right way to do it. You, what there is, is what is right for your district. And this is going to depend on a few factors. It's going to depend upon your student population. So how many gifted students do you have in your population? Uh, what are they gifted in? So are they gifted in various things? Are there, you know, is there a concentration in math or reading or some other subject area? Um, it's also going to depend upon the teachers that you have and their qualifications for teaching gifted students. I mean, putting gifted students together is always a great thing, but if you don't have the right teacher for that, then it's kind of a moot point. So you have to consider all of those factors. So this particular talk, talk is going to be talking about the idea of a magnet program. A magnet program is simply pulling all the kids in from the district into one remote area. So I've, I've had the uh, privilege of working in two different magnet programs at two different districts, and they worked a little bit differently from one another, but the, the central basics of it were that we had multiple buildings that had gifted students. And in those buildings, you would maybe have five to you know, 10 gifted kids in the classroom, and then everyone else in the classroom was not identified as gifted. And so it, it became a challenge for teachers to try to meet the needs of those gifted kids and the, the, the needs of their lower kids and the, the, low, and the um, needs of their middle kids. So we decided to pull all the gifted kids into one class so that the entire class will be made up of gifted students. And this does a few things. Um, one thing it does is it, ma it makes it um, better for the teacher to be able to meet the needs of these students. Gifted students, just like special ed students, have special needs that need to be met. And if we're not meeting those needs, then that student is not going to grow and is not going to become a better student as a result of that. So we have to make sure that we are uh, putting them, you know, challenging them at the level that they're able to. And so that, that's what having a, a magnet program like that does. You put all of the fifth grade gifted kids into one classroom, and then the teacher knows that she's dealing with gifted students and that she can challenge accordingly. Uh, she can, you know, use higher level questioning. She can use different uh, authentic, uh, you know, learning strategies. There's lots of things that, that you can do with them that, that you can do with, with, with regular kids as well. But the fact that the gifted kids can move faster as well. So you can always, you know, you know, go at a quicker pace or go deeper into something as a result of that. The second reason why it's a good idea to have a magnet program is it puts all of your professional development in one area as well. So for, for in other words, if I have teachers spread out among seven or eight different buildings and each one is teaching gifted, um, getting professional development is can be kind of tricky because especially if they're high school or, you know, they're different levels, high school, middle school, elementary where they're starting at different times. So getting them into one room to work on professional development and to collaborate, quite frankly, um, is it's difficult. So when you pull a magnet uh, class together, and so you have, you may have multiple teachers teaching on this and, and the particular magnet program I'm in now, we have eight different teachers. So we have three at the fourth grade level, two at the fifth grade level, and three at the sixth grade level. And so we get together when it's time to on professional development days and we collaborate with one another. We talk about issues that we're having with our students and successes, and we're able to, to have a collaborative environment as a result of that. Uh, and th that's really valuable in that you have all of your your teachers together and you can do that. I, and you know, it, it's also more simple when it comes to professional development because then I can tailor that professional development for that group. And so we spent all year this year working on how what, what we want a graduate from our magnet program to look like. So what were the, are the characteristics that they will have? What are the skills that they will have? And this way everyone's on the same page and we're all working towards the same goal. So when kids go from fourth to fifth to sixth grade, all teachers are working towards that same goal. So that collaborative element is really uh, important when it comes to, to magnet program as well. The final reason why it's very beneficial to have magnet program is that it puts like-minded students together. Uh, I mentioned before in some, some buildings, we may only have three or four gifted kids in a class and they stand out because 
uh, not because they're better than people, but just because they are, they think differently. They, you know, things may come quicker to them. And so as a result, you know, they're, they are going to stick out. And so they're not going to, and they may be embarrassed that they're sticking out. So they may kind of, you know, play dumb as some students have gifted students have done in the past or underachieve. So by pulling all the kids into one location, what you can do is you put kids together with other kids who are like them. Uh, there's a difference between what they call peer mates and age mates. Uh, in the United States, for better or for worse, when kids you know, get around the age of six, they all enter kindergarten at this, together. And, but we all know that those kids are at different levels. So some kids come in knowing their color, some kids don't. Some kids come knowing how to do basic math. Some kids have never seen math before. So there's all various levels. And so, you know, if you are one of those students that is a six-year-old who can read at a third grade level and you know math pretty well, it's gonna be difficult for you to find a peer um, in that class who, who's at that same level as you. But by putting all the students in a, a gifted magnet program together, they're able to find peers. The one, the one thing that I often hear um, from parents is that this is the first time that their child has had a friend because these, these kids are having similar conversations. Uh, and it's not to say that all gifted students are the same, but you know, it tends to when you you know we tend to want to to gravitate towards like-minded individuals to ourselves, whether it be politics, religion, education, whatever. And same goes with gifted kids. So gifted kids, you know, are are somewhat like-minded, and as a result, you know, they're able to uh, you know find people that that they can relate to and that they they feel a more sense of belonging. Uh, and so the way we set up our magnet program, and I have two different versions. So in one district, we had it uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. And we, uh, we, we looped kids. So in other words, we had our math teachers and our language arts teachers teaching two grade levels. So they would teach fifth and sixth grade, and another one would teach seventh and eighth. And so they would have those kids for two years' time. I really enjoyed the looping aspect of it because you really got to know your kids. Uh, being the social studies teacher, I actually had kids for four years. So I had them in fifth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. And as a result, I really knew those kids by the time they were in eighth grade. They knew me really well. They knew what my expectations were. We could start the first day of school. We weren't going over expectations and rules and things of that nature. We were just starting into what we needed to start into because we were, we were aware of each other. Uh, and so I really enjoyed that looping process. Uh, the current district I'm at, the way that we, we do the magnet is teachers are at a specific grade level. So we have, like I said, you know, three fourth grade teachers, two fifth grade teachers, and three sixth grade teachers. And that, that changes depending upon the number of students that we have. So we used to have two fourth grade and three fifth grade. And I, I and eventually we're probably gonna have three, three, and three. But uh, so what that looks like is the, we, we do collaborate together as a team quite a bit, but there's not a lot of cross grade uh, work going on. In other words, we don't have, fifth graders doing sixth grade works with the sixth grade teachers and so on and so forth. So, you know, that, that is the disadvantage of doing it like that. Um, uh, but, you know, there are, there are other advantages that are, that are really good, such as, you know, having someone who's very confident uh, in their content and is familiar with it because you don't want to put someone in a class that they're not familiar with teaching or they're not comfortable teaching. So there are lots of things to consider when you are going to do a magnet program for your gifted students, but here are five of the big ticket items that you should consider. Uh, things that came up in both instances when we formed our magnet programs and my experiences. The first of which is, do you have enough students to create a magnet program? I came in both, in both districts that I did the magnet programs with, they came from, they were fairly sizable districts. They had 10,000 students and 9,000 students. So there was a, a large pool to choose from. And so we set a consistent criteria where students had to be cognitively gifted as well as gifted in reading and in math. And even using that criteria, we were able to, to generate enough students to where we had two to three classrooms for each grade level. Uh, if you were in a smaller district, a magnet program might not be the best fit because you may not have enough kids to create this, this magnet. Um, you, you know, you might be better off just doing clusters or you know, resource rooms or things of that nature uh, because the population is just not as large. If you come from a really large district, like a, a, a you know a, a city city schools, which are typically uh, large, um, then you would you know consider having a magnet school. So students would come from all over the, the district and come to one school rather than have this magnet program housed in a building that shares it with other students as well. 
The second thing to consider is how do you convince the powers that be that it's worth the cost? So that's the thing that will come up from your board and from administration is how much is this cost in the district and is it worth it? Um, and you, you know, there's a few arguments you can make with that. First off, uh, you know, you're meeting the needs of these kids. I mean, gifted kids have needs just as any other kids do. And by not meeting their needs, you know, that's kind of a disservice to them. And so it, it, it definitely should be worth the cost if you look at it that through that, I mean, you know, altruistically. Um, however, you know, sometimes it does come down to the bottom line. So one thing that you can, you can rest assured them you know, is that you're going to use with staff within your district already. So it's, it's no new hires. You're just shifting people around. So when you create the magnet program, you're not increasing the number of students you have. So you should be able to pull uh, people from around the district, and that way you're not really adding any salary to the bottom line. The other thing to consider, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is the cost of transportation. This is one that came up in uh, one of the districts I was in and how much it was costing them to do that. Although it can be argued that those kids are going to be transported no matter what. Uh, and so it doesn't make it, you know, just because there's a magnet program doesn't give an additional cost of transportation. But that's something that you have to make sure that you are explaining to people so that they're aware that there's no misconceptions about how much the, the program is costing. The third thing to consider is, do you have enough staff that's properly trained to work with gifted students? So um, the first district that we did a magnet program with, within the district, we had seven people who were certified gifted. And so they just were simply shifted over into this particular building uh, where the magnet program was housed. And we, we had confidence that they were properly trained because they had the certification. Uh, the second district that we did a magnet program with, no one who was hired for the team had their gifted certification. But upon condition of hire or upon condition of coming to that position, they, they agreed to get their gifted certification. Uh, but keep in mind, uh, the bottom line is that you definitely want people who move high ability kids. So someone can be certified and gifted and not do that very well. So you do want to make sure that you're looking for candidates that through their data or through their, you know, past, uh, you know, past data that they are showing that they can grow high ability kids because that's the teachers that you want teaching that those classes. I would rather have a highly qualified teacher um, who is not gifted certified than to get a certified person who doesn't move high ability kids. The fourth thing to consider is where is your magnet program going to be housed? So there are a couple of options. Like one is to centrally locate it. So have it in one building in the center of the, since you're pulling kids from all over the district in this way, no one is coming from really far away. Uh, the district that I'm at currently, we're, we're housed in a building at one end of the district and kids have to ride on the bus anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes if they're coming from the far end of the district. And that's not ideal. So. That's something to consider. You also have to consider, is there, are there enough classrooms or space? Uh, we were fortunate in the first magnet program that I did that we were housed at a building that was kind of going through a transition. So we had an entire wing to ourselves and we could stay very autonomous from the, so we were a small school within the school. We were, we were making decisions for ourselves and running our own program uh, within the school that was being, you know, um, supervised by an administrator that was dealing with the other parts of the school. So that's something to consider as well. Um, in, in another thing that you have to consider is you don't want to, you have to consider how it looks where you put it. So if you put it at the most economically affluent building in your district, um, that's just going to, to feed into the idea that a lot of people have that gifted is elitist and is only for rich kids, which we know is not the case, but it's definitely is going to send that message. So you have to consider you know, politically where, where you're going to put it and why you're putting it where you're, you're going to do that. So that's another thing that a lot of thought needs to be given to is where you're going to house it. The last thing to consider, and this is one that came up in both instances, is how transportation was going to be handled. So the first district that I worked at um, already bus, we, we had a lot of school of choices already. So it wasn't a big deal because the transportation was used to take, used to taking kids all over the district. Uh, but the second district I was at, they, they were very local, there were local schools. And so people were going to their neighborhood schools and all of a sudden we had to pull in kids from all over the district and we had to figure out how to do that. So that again, so kids weren't on the bus for 45 minutes. Uh, we've gotten better at it. We get kids here at, at a, you know, a more quick manner, 